We started on a journey a couple weeks ago, and uh, we ended uh, two weeks ago with, with the question that Paul asked uh, to the church of Corinth, uh, what good things do you have that are not from God? And we said James answered that question when he said every good and every perfect gift comes from above. And, and last week we, we dealt in the past with, with unclaimed gifts and how God gives us this ability for forgiveness. But if we don't choose to forgive, we have these unclaimed gifts. He said, if you can't forgive, I won't forgive you. And so we're going to deal in the present today, and I direct your attentions to the book of John, the 14th chapter. We're going to start at the 25th verse. Jesus speaking, John 14 and verse 25, he said, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And I focus your attention on this last verse. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I, I, I like the way it reads in a, a different translation. So allow me to just read it again in the New Living Translation. Verse 27, he says this, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. I think as we look towards this holiday season and as we look to next year and the uncertainty that may lie ahead, I think God has a gift for each one of us. And so if you would allow me to, I want to speak to you on this topic, unopened gifts, unopened gifts. Drop your Bible with me. Would you raise your hands? And let's just invite the presence of the Lord. He's in here, but let's invite him to speak to us today. Would you do that? Jesus, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together in this place. Thank you for your spirit that has been moving up and down these aisles. And I pray right now, God, that the word would go forth with clarity and that our ears would be open to receive what you would have. Our guards would be let down, God, and that we would hear, God, what the Spirit is saying in this hour. We thank you, we worship you, and we praise you, for you are so good to us. And we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, and you may be seated. It was a camp meeting in West Bend, Wisconsin. The year was 1889, and during this time, camp meetings were a very common occurrence. They would take place all over the country, and they would usually last for days, if not weeks, and would be held in the open air under a big tent. These meetings provided opportunity for churches to gather together with fellowship and singing, but more importantly than that was the preaching that would take place after the singing. Preaching that focused on repentance. Preaching that focused on the need for salvation. And after one such event, an attendee who was present wrote about their experience. And they said it this way. They said, the sermons grew increasingly sensational and impassioned and excited and the response of the crowd grew more and more prolonged. By the second or third day, people were crying out during the sermons and shouting prayers and bursting into loud lamentations. They began grabbing at their neighbor and desperately pleading with them to repent. They sobbed uncontrollably and ran in terror through the crowd, shoving aside everybody in their path. God was moving at these camp meetings. This camp meeting in West Bend was seemingly no different as the story goes, it was at the conclusion of one of these impactful services that Warren Carnell, an itinerant preacher, remained alone sitting in the large tent, pondering and considering what had just happened. He was overwhelmed by the service, and he took some time to be alone and pray and meditate on what he had experienced and felt. And after some time, he felt inspiration and pulled out a pen and paper and jotted down the, the thoughts that flooded his mind. When he concluded, he 
gave no thought to what he had written on the paper. He put the piece of paper in his pocket and walked out. But unbeknownst to him that as he put the paper in his pocket, it missed and it fell on the ground. Pastor Cooper, the host pastor, entered the tent sometime later and spotted the piece of paper on the ground as he was cleaning up the camp and getting ready for the next service. And as he reached down and picked up the piece of paper, immediately he was drawn to the words and the heartfelt meaning and truth in which they expressed. Wasting no time, he, he dropped his responsibilities and duties and he moved his way over to the organ and began to compose the tune or the melody to the song we know today. The verse went something like this, Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than psalm. In celestial strains it unceasingly fails o'er my soul like an infinite calm. You may not be familiar with the verse, but maybe, just maybe, you've heard the chorus that goes something like this. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Have you heard that song? What a wonderful expression of such an amazing truth. What a beautiful depiction of the timeless treasure we have access to, the peace of God. Such a wonderful peace that floods our hearts and fills our mind. However, long before Cornell would pen the words to this song about the wonderful peace of God, a group of outcasts gathered in a field and would be the recipient of a similar song. They weren't attending a tent revival. Most wouldn't even consider them religious or remotely close. But as they sat in that field that day, they heard a song that was accompanied after good news. And Luke records the song when he says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, or singing if I might say it that way, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The announcement of the Savior came with the exaltation of his purpose, peace on earth. However, unlike the first song, many have misunderstood the angel's song as a blanket statement of world peace. Many have been misled into thinking that this peace is somehow entitled or deserved. That this peace just comes because of the birth of a child. But sadly, that's not the case. Because contained within another rendition is a more accurate understanding of this song. And the New Living Translation says, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. You see, peace is not assured to all but only to those who are pleasing to God, the objects of his good pleasure, if you will. Peace is granted to those to whom God desires to grant it to. And long before this announcement, Isaiah would peer behind the curtain and would get a peek into the future. And Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 would give him an idea of what was to come when he said, For unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There would be many attributes and acclaims ascribed to Jesus. However, Isaiah would announce him as the Prince of Peace. He would be the source of peace but he would also be the supplier of peace. You see, to know him is to know peace. To have relationship with him is to experience peace. What Isaiah prophesied, what the angels proclaim, revealed this timeless truth. Before I can have peace from God, I first need to have peace with God. Before I can be a recipient 
of his peace. I need to have a relationship with him. You, you see, here is the reality. Our sinfulness, our selfishness, our flesh stands in the way from having peace with God. Paul would say, inside me, in me, in this flesh, dwells no good thing. Our flesh is the source of conflict and separation from God's peace. That The choices that we've made, the decisions that we made, make us an enemy at times to him. But I'm so thankful for what Paul wrote and what he understood as he thought about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He would say it later in verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. He's saying what, what you're given is not deserved because you have offended for it's by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offense resulted in justification. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift from God. You see, I've learned that a gift is only good if opened. You know, I don't know about you. I like receiving gifts. In case you're trying to fill out your new pastor, I absolutely love receiving gifts. And I'd love to take this time just to tell you some of the places I like to eat at, some of the things, hobbies I enjoy. But there's nothing that bothers me more than when I give a gift to somebody and they just say, thanks, and they don't open it. Right? The, the excitement of the gift is watching the sparkle in their eye as they open it. And sometimes you give a gift to someone and there's that awkwardness like, you want me to open it? Or like, it's just like, thank you. Like, you've been there, right? You've given a gift to someone and they just are like, thanks a lot. And you're like, you don't even know what's in there. You may hate it. <laughs> open it, you know? Yeah. See, a gift is only given, good if given. And it's only good if it's opened. I remember one year at Christmas, we came in, there was presents around the tree, and then the presents began to disappear as we opened, and then there was that one that was just in the back there. And mom and dad had said that all the gifts were done, but there was another gift there. <laughs> so Melissa, Becky, and I are leveling with each other like, Who, whose is this? We're done, guys. And we're like, no, no, no. There's, there's another gift under the tree that's unopened. The, the, the suspicion, the allure. We can't do anything until you tell us what this gift is. They finally were like, it's not for you. Like, well, then why'd you put it under the tree? Find someplace else, the laundry room. That's where everything else goes. But so it is with the gift of God. We have... This gift, he, he said, we're justified by faith. Justification is, is the act of him making us righteous. That, that's the part he did. That's the grace of God. That's something he freely gave because of his death, his burial, his resurrection. He reconciled. We learned about that word on Wednesday. He, he, he made hostility friendship. He changed the, our relationship status on Facebook, if you will. To it's from it's complicated to in a relationship with. I just thought about that. That was pretty good. And so he gives us this gift. He says, Nick, I have a gift for you. It's a free gift. It's a gift you haven't deserved. There's nothing you could do to deserve this. As a matter of fact, when you open it, you'll realize nothing you could do. Your life disqualifies you from the gift, but this is the gift. 
And Nick can choose to say, oh, gee, thanks, God, and I appreciate it. I, I accept this gift. No, just leave it. Just hold on. There's nothing in there. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Open it up. Just open it up. You're going to be disappointed. It's the same thing I got you last year. But, but how many of us and how many other, other denominations, they look at the gift this way? They say, all you have to do is say a prayer and say, I accept the gift. Thank you for the gift, God. I appreciate it. I'm so heartfelt, filled with gratitude. Mmm, a gift. And God's saying, well, open it up. But, but, I, but I said a prayer. I made a declaration. I, accept, I, David Meyer, hereby accept this gift. Thank you so much. I, I, I read a story uh, about a man who broke up uh, with his high school sweetheart. And, and uh, when she broke up with him and tore out his heart, she gave him a gift. And for 49 years, that gift sat in his house. And, and they said like around year 35, his kids started putting it under the tree. And every year they'd say, Dad, open it. He's like, no, I'm not opening it. Bad memories. I don't want to open it. I don't want anything from her. And, and after 48 years, he opened up the gift. How many of us have, have approached? How many people out there understand that there's a gift and they think, well, well great, I, I have this gift. I, I'm holding on to this gift. I have my eternal salvation. He's like, no, no, no. You're still at odds with me. There's still a strain. You want peace with God, but you need to first have peace from God. You need to have peace in this relationship. And in order for you to have peace, you have to open this gift. We're justified by faith. And faith is our response to open the gift and say, oh, oh, I have to repent of my sins. Acts 2 and 38 says that I, I have to repent. I, I need to realize that the things that I've done, the lifestyle that I've lived, the choices I've made have grieved the heart of God and have moved me in an opposite direction and have caused a strain on the relationship. It have taken me back to it's complicated with God. But repentance changes that. It's where I say, God, I'm sorry. I, I, I confess the things that I've done and I'm, I'm going to forsake this lifestyle. I don't want to do this anymore, God. And he says, but but go on, there, there's more in the gift. You know those gifts? The gifts you opened up and there's more in it? It's usually a gift bag, right? And you open one thing out, you're like, yeah, and they're like, they said that look in your face, like, there's more. And your heavenly father, after you repent, after you come down to an altar, he's looking at you with a smile going, there's more, there's more. You see that, see that baptismal tank under there? You can be buried with me in baptism. You can be baptized for the remission of your sins in the saving name of Jesus Christ. And, and as you go under the water, every sin that you have committed will be washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. And as you come up out of that water, you're a new man. All things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. I celebrate the 15 people that have been buried with him in baptism, that have names have been written in the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for the blood that's been applied to their life. But God looks at you after you come out of the water and says, still more. Look in the bag. Well, what else is in there? You can receive my spirit, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. The, the, the evidence that you have my gift is you'll begin to speak in another language and it won't make sense to you, but it, it's a sign that, that the Spirit of God has filled you to overflowing and the evidence will be that it will come out of your mouth and you'll begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. It's not a gift I give as pastor. It's not a gift that anyone in this church can give you, but it's a gift that comes from God. But a gift is only good if opened. He said, you're justified by faith. See, when we do that, the response gives us peace with God. Peace with God was a part of the announcement of his birth, but peace from God was part of the announcement before his death. And as Jesus sat at the Last Supper with his disciples, understanding the events that were about to transpire, understanding that Judas, the son of perdition, was going to betray him, uh, understanding that Peter, the one that had been there, is going to deny that he knows, knowing that all the brothers are going to leave him. He looks at them and he says, I'm leaving you a gift, peace of mind and heart. 
And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. Understand what he's saying. It was, it was common practice that when a Jew would leave another Jew's house, when there was a, a going away, that they would say, peace be unto you. He said, I'm not just giving you an empty gesture, but I'm giving you a gift. I'm not just saying goodbye to you, but I have a gift. It was peace that would calm the mind. It was peace that would comfort the heart. He would later remind them of the gift before he concludes the meal. And he said, these things I have spoken to you, John 16 and 33, that in me you may have peace. And he tells them why the gift is so important. He says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He said, let me tell you something, boys. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be tribulation. Trials are going to come. Hardships are going to befall you. You're going to wrestle at times with your health. You're going to experience the sting of rejection because I was rejected. You're going to have to drink in the cup of rejection. News is going to get worse and worse. And as as you look outside, you're going to see dark clouds and storms. and, 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 And the propensity is going to be to be fearful, to be concerned. He said, but I have a gift. Be of good cheer. What you see out there, I've already overcome it. The, the news may look bleak. The economic downfall and recession might be the things that all the news outlets are saying, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You may have just gone to your doctors and got some bad news. You, you may have had hardship after hardship, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What does that mean? That means I don't lose control in the midst of the storm. I don't lose control when things look like they're dark and bleak and when things look like they're seemingly hopeless. I, I don't lose control. I have overcome the world. He said, be of good cheer. But again, it's a gift. It's a gift that's only good if opened. Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, told them how to unwrap the gift. And for those of you that were here a couple Wednesdays ago, this might sound redundant, but I thought it was too good not to restate. Paul, writing to them, says, Be anxious for nothing. What is Paul saying? He's saying, Don't worry. This isn't a suggestion that Paul was giving the church. This was a command. He said, as you look outside and as you see things that are concerning, as you read the newspaper and as you listen to the news outlets and as you talk to that person at work that knows everything that's going on behind the scenes, and they have their ear to the wire and they know exactly when all the events will... Don't worry. Don't worry. He was echoing the commands of Jesus. Jesus, before he left, said, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. But before Jesus got to that point, he said, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life in Matthew 6 and 25. Whether you have enough food and drink. Well, that seems like a concern. He said, Don't even worry about that. Don't worry if you open your cupboards and it looks pretty bare. Don't worry if you go over to your closet and all your pants have holes in their knees. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? I, I see the sparrow that falls. I clothe the lilies. Don't you think I'm going to clothe you? Don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Don't you think I see the tears you cry in private? Don't you think he's saying, but your job is not to worry. He said in verse 27, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Worry is a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you get nowhere. But worry is also a dark room in which negatives are developed. And the more I worry, the more worry becomes the thief of joy. The more worry becomes the thief of faith. The the more worry becomes the thief of what God can do, the possible. Worry has no value. So Paul said, "Be be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to God. He said, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. 
Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Sometimes we get this backwards. We worry about everything and we pray about nothing. Paul said, reverse it. That's the problem with you. That's the problem why you're so concerned. That's the problem why you have no peace in your life because you're worrying about everything and you're praying about nothing. And here is where we we get logical. But does God really care about my flat tire? I mean, does God really care, you know? And we trivialize the things that are taking place in our life, thinking that, that, that God only is concerned with the big things. But Paul said, pray about everything. Everything is the proper subject of prayer, meaning there are no areas of your life that are off limits to God. There's no areas of your life that you come to God and he says, yeah, I don't really care to hear about that, Maria. Pray about something else. No, no, God says, you can cast all your cares on me because I care for you. So every care you have, every concern you have, everything that that tries to attack your mind and tries to steal your joy, you can bring that to me. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. And then he continues, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, he says the peace of God that makes no sense, the, the peace of God that you can't explain, the peace of God that you can't fathom. Have you ever been in a moment where you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you have perfect peace? Have you ever been there where a, a trial or, or something was going on? We just went to a funeral of, of a man that I grew up with and I was talking to his son and he says, we just have peace in the midst of this. I talked to a young man whose, whose dad unexpectedly died a couple weeks ago, and he said the same thing. Our family just has peace. It, it makes no sense. It's a peace that passes all understanding. You see, as a result of not worrying and praying with thanksgiving about everything, the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. You, you see, that word guard speaks of a military action. It means to stand at attention. It means to make sure that nothing's getting in. He says, here's your part. Your part is don't worry about anything. Your part is pray about everything. And then I'll dispatch my angels, and they're going to stand around you. And when the enemy tries to come in and whisper in your ear, when the, when the enemy comes in like the flood, my spirit will raise up a standard and say, no, you can't come against this one. No, no, you're going to have to go down the road. He's not worried about it. He's praying about everything. And so the blood of Jesus is applied and the peace that passes all understanding is standing watch. And you can't come here, devil. You can't come and speak lies in his mind. You can't try to deceive him. You can't try to distort reality because my peace is at attention. Don't worry about anything. But David, no, 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 no. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And his peace will encamp around about you. His peace will thwart the attacks of the enemy. But Paul continued. He said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You see, Paul realized that our thoughts shape our identity and our conduct. Jesus said that, that out of the abundance of the heart, mouth speaks. That as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so he said it's important that you also manage your thought life. It's important that, that, that yes, my angels are going to guard, and, and yes, my peace is going to stand watch around you, but you still control what you allow to come in. You can do a great disservice when you worry about nothing and you pray about everything, but then you become consumed and fixated on all the things that are taking place. I can tell you, it's proven that people that spend at least, I think, 30 minutes on Facebook a day are more depressed. People that spend more time in news outlets are more anxious. You see, what you meditate on, what you fixate on, the things you watch, the things you allow to come into your mind, 
He says, meditate on the right things. Is it true? That, that, that sometimes rules out 90% of the content we listen to. Is it true? No, it's not true. Then don't think about it. It, it could happen. Well, then, it, then it's not true. <laughs> it hasn't happened. I, I'm the one in control. <laughs> so if you're fixating on what hasn't happened, you're fixating on what could and what might. Is it noble? Is it just? Is it pure? Much of the Christian life comes down to the mind. Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a daily thing we have to do to renew our mind. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, there's no better way to renew your mind than in the word of God. We're coming to the beginning of January when everyone starts to make resolutions. I would say make a resolution to read the word of God. Four chapters a day will allow you to read it through in a year. And as you fixate on the words of God, as you read the truth that's contained within its pages, it's amazing how it sets the course of your day. It's amazing how I fixate on things and the things that I study and the things I meditate on. All of a sudden, life throws something at me, and what I read that morning gives me the answer to the problem I'm facing later that day. You see, you want God to speak to you. He wants to do it every morning. You're saying, but I just need a word from God. I, I just need him to help me to answer all my problems. He's saying, I, I have instruction manual. I, I have something where I'd like to speak to you every morning. I, I'd like to get into your heart. I'd like to get into your family. I, I'd like to give in. I would like to be a part of your solution. You see, after Paul tells you what to think on, he continues, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do and the God of peace will be with you. He said, listen, if, if, you, if you worry about nothing, if you pray about everything, my peace will guard you. But if you emulate your life after me and you fixate and meditate on the right things, the God of peace will guide you. So not only will the peace of God guard me, but the God of peace will walk beside me and we'll say, no, you, you probably shouldn't go there. No, you probably shouldn't do that. No, you probably shouldn't look at this. No, you probably should do this. You, you see, Scripture says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God, meaning that he walks beside us with every step, that when I'm walking in his will and I'm walking where he wants me to go, he's right beside me, and we're co-laborers together for his kingdom. And, and if I would meditate and think on the right things, he said, I'll be with you. I'll walk beside you. I'll be the filter for which the things you think about go through. I'll direct you. Would you stand with me? Jesus said, John 14 and 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. But, but understand something about the moment that's happening here. The Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. So Jesus spoke of a future gift, a helper. Other places he called him a comforter, one who would bring to memory, one who would teach. But in order for them to receive this gift, the Prince of Peace would have to go away. But Jesus said, this gift that's coming, check your UPS tracker. My father's sending it. And, and he's going to send it in my name. And so there they were on the day of Pentecost. And all of a sudden, a gift arrived. And it said, to the church, to all that will from the Prince of Peace. And all of a sudden, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. And people that were standing round about and didn't understand what was taking place began to question, began to mock. And Peter said, no, 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 these are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, saying, in the last days, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. 
And as he begins to unwrap this gift for them, they feel conviction. They're, they're filled with questions. And they said, Peter, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In a moment, that gift was unwrapped. And we see that every turn, the Spirit led them with peace. We see that living in the Spirit produces spiritual fruit, of which one is the gift of peace. We, we see that walking in the Spirit produces spiritual armor, of which our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We see that spiritual disciplines like prayer and supplication give us unexplainable peace. The Holy Ghost is the gift that allows us to access an endless reserve of peace. And so it is today. I don't know. Maybe you've never spoken in other tongues as the Spirit gave you the utterance. Or maybe, just maybe, it's been a long time. Wherever you are, I want to invite you to this altar. Not to bury your, your head in the carpet, but to lift your hands in a sign of surrender and saying, God, I want that spirit. Maybe it's I just need it to be renewed in my life. I need a refilling of that spirit. If that is you today, would you be so bold as to come down to this altar and say, I want a refilling of his spirit. I want another touch of his holy presence. If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, I want to invite you to come down to this altar. Stand with me if you would. Remain standing. This gift is for all who will. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. He realized it was a daily occurrence. I'm going to wait a little bit longer. If there's someone else in this place that needs a refilling of his spirit, I want you to be bold and to come before the throne with boldness and confidence. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to collectively repent together. And if I could get some, some individuals to gather around these men that are here, we're going to ask God to forgive us together everyone in this building and so if we could lift our hands all across this building scripture says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness and so let's open our mouth and ask God to forgive us Jesus Lord I thank you today for everything that you have done for us Lord we come to you today and ask that you would forgive us God Lord where we've messed up where we've made mistakes Lord, forgive us, Lord, of wrong words, Lord, that have maybe come out of our mouth, Lord. Actions, Lord, that weren't pleasing to you. God, moments in our life where we've made choices and decisions that grieved your heart, that went against your law. God, I pray right now that your forgiveness and your mercy, God, which is accessible to everyone, God, would wipe away a multitude of transgressions. Hear us today, God. Cleanse us today. Forgive us today, Jesus, of our trespasses. Forgive us, God, today of the things we've done. Help us, Lord, today to live holy, pleasing, and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. All right, I want to get your attention. I want to get your attention here for a minute. This gift requires us to open our mouth. That's the way in which we receive it. And as we begin to worship and as we begin to praise, the Spirit of God comes out of us. It's not anything you'll understand. It's not anything that's going to be uh, that you've learned. No, it's the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so I'm going to pray a prayer of faith. And when I say hallelujah, I want you to raise your voice and say hallelujah. And then just to begin to let words come out. And all of a sudden, you're going to feel your language change. And when that happens, I want you to not resist it, not fight it. But that's the Holy Ghost. I want you to let that out, all right? Can we raise our hands all across this place? My intercessors start to intercede. 
by the authority of the Word of God and by the power that is in the name of Jesus I pray right now God that Lord your spirit and your power would come down into this place and every person God that is searching every person who is desiring every person who is wanting God would be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost hallelujah